Good morning guys from Facebook. Yonkers Voice membership are always waiting for you to come into our bi-weekly show. Well, it's my pleasure. It's, uh, it's, it's a terrific show. It's a weekly show where we have an opportunity to uh, look at the issues we face in our community, in our state, in our nation. And uh, it's an opportunity to really let the listening audience know what, what's going on. And, uh, and it's really a way of telling the listening audience to really become aware and speak up on various issues that confront us in today's time. So, pleasure yeah. to be here. Seems like there was a whole bunch of people waiting for you to come on, and uh -huh. here they are already engaging. Wow. We have an agenda today. Sure. But besides the agenda, we're going to speak about a few other things. Okay. okay. But we have an agenda to go by. Sure. Uh, and the first thing, it's something that is very hot on people's minds today, school reopening. How are we going to manage this? Well, school reopening uh, really is the most crucial issue confronting us. And, uh, and again, you know, being an educator, uh, for me, I understand how complex it is. Uh, we understood that uh, when we, especially in Yonkers, our students had to go on online instruction, it was very difficult. Uh, many of our children did not have the proper technology, and many of our children really uh, needed you know, that in-classroom instruction, especially children that are learning another language, English language learners, children that, are, that have special needs, learning disabilities. These are children that need a teacher face-to-face -face or a, a staff member that's working with them. So the, the state of New York and the governor's office uh, really had a very difficult task because many individuals across the state were lobbying hard to open schools. And not only in New York, but the entire nation, uh, parents wanted their kids back into the classrooms. But then we're dealing with the pandemic. It's very dangerous. Uh, it, we're, we're expecting possibly another spike, you know, in the coronavirus. And uh, therefore, there's a lot of precautions. And there's many individuals that are threatening the governor and school boards across the state that don't open schools too prematurely. Uh, parents are still concerned about their kids going back to classroom when there's still a potential danger. And now we're finding out that COVID-19 does not exclude children and, and young, young people. So therefore, you have that ongoing conflict of those that want uh, to return back to the classroom and those that don't want. And many school districts were given the option, like Yonkers, you know, by the governor, plans were submitted, and Yonkers took a, an approach that basically satisfies both elements, where you had a combination of in-classroom, you know, traditional learning, and you had also hybrid. Hybrid was a combination of in-classroom and online learning. So I believe that, uh, you know, with the safety measures in place, uh, like taking the temperature, requiring uh, safety gear and masks, and uh, limiting the amount of individuals who would be able to go into a school, that, you know, we can start off with, with the concept of safety, where parents can feel to a large extent that school districts have taken the precautions to make sure that while we open schools, it's done in a gradual way where it's a combination of online and also in-classroom instruction. Now, we, we understand that although there's talk of a vaccine and the potential of vaccines now is in the news every single day, that uh, there's a chance that we can start vaccination and then feel a little bit more secure and safe. But for the time being, we gotta realize there's still a lot of uncertainty we got to realize education is important. We got to realize we want our kids back into a learning atmosphere. In, the, in today's time, it's very untraditional, but we're beginning to realize we got to live into a new world, a new norm, where we can shop like we used to, we can go to restaurants like we used to, and we can't expect education to be as we as used, used to. to. But, uh, Mr. Nader, I heard the, the Zoom, you know, I saw the Zoom meeting 
last week or yeah. was it Monday? I'm not sure. A few yeah. days ago. And uh, I saw the, the Dr. Casada speaking about the concerns and all that. But what I did not hear okay, was the concern for the workers. I heard yeah. about the parents. I heard yeah. about the kids. What about the workers? Well, the workers is also a concern, of course. And, uh, you know, I received a letter as a state uh, assemblyman from the various labor organizations, the YFT, Federation of Teachers, and the YCA, Council of the School Administrators, and the CSCA, Civil Service Employees. Of course, they're concerned. And many of them are saying, you know, why should we be rushed back into schools, you know, when there's still a lot of uncertainty and the potential of uh, a spread of the virus, especially among staff members and the potential harm that can cause is tremendous. So we realize that. And uh, so, as I said earlier, you, you have safety concerns and honestly, they're not going away. You know, so I preach that, yeah, we should be very concerned about safety and there isn't any clear-cut solution to how you handle this. So the direction that the state and the governor's office and school districts like Yonkers have taken is really one that allows for instruction to start, you know, with a, with a perception and, a, and an approach, whereas if there is evidence of, of a spread of the virus, then there's a plan B and plan C in place to close schools again and go completely online again. Now, with with many parents going back to work, that's that's a major issue with the kids staying at home. Uh, many parents can't afford babysitting services or can't afford uh, child care services. So it's really an issue. Well, well Mr. Ned, it to lots of people, that is the issue. That is. Because economy cannot open unless schools open. Because yeah, exactly. parents will not go to work. <laughs> right. Okay. And uh, not because they don't want to. It's because many of them cannot afford a babysitter. And they can't. Whatever they make is not enough. But you're right. See, that's, <clears throat> that's, what, that's what's confronting us. In anything we do on the national, on the local, state level, you know, any decision you make, there, there, there's there's a, uh, a follow-up reaction correct and and employment and careers and trying to restore you know lives back to normal you know we're looking at what's normal and many of us are realizing what was once normal is not normal today it's it's you know something of the past change. yeah something of the past you look at you look at uh, when you go around the city of Yonkers and you go to a major avenues where years ago you, you can barely find a vacant store. Now you look and you see every other store is vacant, you know, so that's impacted. It's sad, you know, yeah, sir? it's sad. It's impacting the commercial end of it. People are not shopping. You know, the old days of, you know, you got to have a street front. Now look, the only business that's doing really well is Amazon. Everybody is shopping online. The cyber world is very happy because they are making a ton of money. They because are. everyone buys online today. Yeah, they are. I, I see it with my own kids and my family where, you know, maybe a, a couple of years ago, maybe 10% was online shopping. In my household now, I would, I would say 75% at least is In online shopping. In my household shopping. too. Uh, two days ago, I went to the mall. It was such a, a sad, you know, sighting. I remember I used to go to the mall and just the uh, eye shop, you know, look. Now you go, every other store is kind of closed. Yeah, yeah. It's sad. It's going sad. to bring a lot of other business. Now, I have a question here from Adriana Estremera. Ask the assemblyman about the preschool children who get service. Why aren't options given to them? Well, because, because you know, putting on my former Board of Education trustee hat, uh, as I said, with the uncertainties going on, you know, maybe maybe school officials and politicians and others that are making decisions uh, may not say so, but many of them, I'm sure, are confronted with because of the uncertainties, n not being sure uh, how they would deal with having especially younger children. I mean, I can tell you as an educator, and I agree with the parents that are concerned, 
that uh, provide an educational stability, especially for the pre-K grade level and the kindergarten grade level is crucial. And those children, you know, really tremendously need immediately that educational learning atmosphere. They need the teacher to teach them speech and teach them word recognition and shapes and so forth. You know, but I really advise parents any any way they can, uh, anything they can do to provide some of those skills at home. You know, I would recommend that they do that. I mean, I I recommend to many parents that I have contact with, especially that have younger children, you know, to look and see what games, what programs, what services are out there. You know, sad to say that you can't fully depend on our educational system in today's time because of the uncertainty. But it doesn't mean we sit back, you know, so whenever we see a void, whenever we see a gap, we as parents need to make sure we make every attempt to fill that void. Correct. And filling that void it means maybe taking extra steps. It maybe it may mean, unfortunately, you have to purchase some games and supplies that are out there on the market where we can teach our kids at home in spare time. Now, uh, I have to give a shout out to my friend, Hector Santiago. You know Hector well, the Connector? Of course, of course. Definitely. Hector the Connector, creator of the uh, handshake. The handshake. The handshake. Stop and shake. Stop and Stop shake. and shake. Great program, doing goods for the of community. Because it's building, create that relationship between law enforcement and community. This is the actor's uh, question. Much blessing to both of us. Thank, Thank you, actor. Thank you, actor. My question is: Is there anything in place to help the approval process for child care subsidy? The federal government, you know, that's one of the main issues the state delegation and the federal delegation has been targeting. Now, the president recently signed executive orders, you know, assuring that there's a continuation of unemployment stimulus benefits. Rather than 600, the president's plan is $400. You know, so in a way, people are happy that there's at least a recognition for unemployment, eviction processes, but there's also a tremendous amount of discussions about child care. And child care is one of those areas that, as I said earlier, that's a time in a, in a, in a young person's life, especially when they're a child, that they need all the services that, that is required to give them the opportunity to learn and grow. So uh, from, you know, what I recommend is that, you know, uh, members and parents and individuals that have concerns should really contact, you know, the assembly office, contact the state senators, contact the federal officials. Even though we've had a lot of uncertainty with potential change with the federal delegation, with the election of new Congress people, but I'm sure they'll get the proper staff on board and we'll continue to lobby for child care services. Now, Mr. Nader, you know about the proposed layoffs for the Board of Education. Yeah. But now we're hearing about the alternative uh, methods of education, a few days in school, a few days home. So while you're in school, you're engaging with the one-on-one -on -one teacher. You have a teacher. Now, while you're at home, you're going to engage with the teacher also on a... Sure. So we're cutting people, but now we're going to ha need two sets of teachers for the same grade. For ones in school and ones at home. How are we going to manage that? Well, see, with the, w the way the Board of Ed is planning that is that a classroom teacher that has a class, and if half the kids are in class, they're there two days a week, and the other half are online. And the teacher will have a day and have uh, within their scheduled time where they can prepare and interact. So while they're teaching the kids in classroom, you know, face-to-face -face instruction, the other kids have assignments and have plans already in place where they're working on their plans. So when they come into the classroom, then they'll, they'll go over the plans and uh, the lesson plans given to them. Now, we knew all along that that was gonna be an issue with labor and the federa teacher federation unions and so forth. And, and this is why I think, you know, the understanding from our end as a general public 
is to tell school administrators and labor organizations and others involved in education that this is really unusual time. And although we have contracts, we have labor negotiations and process, we need now more than ever to really display flexibility, to work together, because at the end of the day, we're involved with education. Our goal should be the best interest of the child. And, and we need to recognize that it's extremely difficult in today's times, you know, to have a clear answer. And if you wanted to have the proper staff, and as you said, it's impossible to have a set of teachers for the in-class and a set of teachers, you know, directly involved with online. So the middle solution that becomes affordable, you know, is what we're talking about, where a teacher is given flexibility to have half her class or his class in the classroom and online, and the same teacher will deal. If they have a teacher aide, as many younger kids have today, those staff members, teaching assistants and teacher aides, would be involved to assist, assist the teacher I'm sure with some of the online instruction that's going on. Now, what about the special kids that uh, have a problem? This is actually a question from Hansa Kaleri. Yeah. She's asking a question about the special education kids that have a problem with things on them, meaning yeah. headphones or, or computer or cannot be touched. How is the, the Board of Education, if you know, addressing this issue to deal with those young kids. Well, that's that's why, you know, we've said all along that, you know, we said earlier in the show that children with disabilities, special ed children, English language learners, they need in-classroom instruction. You know, if a child has a, a speech difficulty, a learning disability, they it's very difficult to teach that child speech therapy online. You know, you need someone to be there face-to-face, one-to-one. Part of the state delegation efforts with that field was to lobby the state to demand that school districts provide that face-to-face -face online service for special ed children as soon as possible. That was one of the main issues two months ago that the governor finally agreed and said that by July that school districts must put into place programs to provide that individualized one-to-one -one instruction. So I think it's a point well taken. I think the government has really encouraged school districts, including Yonkers, to immediately address that problem. And, and it's something as a state legislator that I would be pushing for. As we said earlier, I think the, the group with the highest needs is, as we said, early childhood, special education, and English language learners. Now, Mr. Nader, you know, uh, a comment supportive of you, well, most comments are very Thank thankful you. for what you do. This one comes from Nena Akoma Onanaji. We must, well, yes, we must stand for our vulnerable students. Nader Sayej, you are very supportive of the special needs community. We must restore the special education department and find a way to get $20 million for the special needs community. You want to address that? Yes, definitely. You know, all along, we've recognized that education, especially in Yonkers, has been seriously shortchanged. And the reason I say that, Yonkers for many years, because of what I consider an inequitable state funding formula, the way the state funds education in New York is based on a formula that considers you know, the educational districts that are in what they consider wealthy counties. And, and those that are in wealthy counties get a lot less aid from the state per kid. Yonkers kids historically get some $5,000 a year less in state funding per child than similar school districts like Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse. I have a bill in Albany that I'm lobbying for. It's Assembly Bill 8700. And we're lobbying hard, we're encouraging advocates for special education, PTAs, educators, teachers, administrators, to continue to lobby to pass this bill, which would make the funding formula more fair and base it on the actual economics of the student population. 
in Yonkers and elsewhere, we look at the number of our kids on free and reduced lunch. That's a good indicator of their economic status. Not, not the fact that Yonkers happens to be in Westchester County that we know is a rich county, but you gotta look at the student population. So the state delegation, you know, for years in the school districts have fought against this inequitable funding formula. I took it a step further because I recognize, even when I was a, a school principal for many years, as a Board of Ed trustee and president, we fought and we went up to Albany with PTA and special ed representatives and fought the state to change that. Fortunately, the bill is in Albany. It's, it's sponsored in the assembly by yours truly. And hopefully, you know, my goal is to get the bill passed. If we can get $5,000 a year more in state funding and have the state give us what they give other urban school districts, I think we can take care of our special ed needs, our English language learners, adult education, technology training, and all the other goodies out there that a lot of times we in Yonkers are lacking. Now, uh, Mr. Nader, let's talk about the performance of uh, Board of Education, Board of Trustees. On a scale from one to 10, one being the worst, 10 being the best, what would you, how would you rank our Board of Education in connection, in relationship to the crisis? I think, I think in all honesty, uh, whenever we have a crisis, sometimes, you know, it's human nature. We point fingers at people that are making decisions and people that are in charge. But the truth of the matter is, this is really a concern that, was, that really hit us very hard, not only in Yonkers, the entire state and nation. The coronavirus really throw, threw everything out of whack. So, you know, for me, you know, I rather, I rather say that, you know, you can't really blame those decision makers for coronavirus. You can't blame them for inequitable funding, let's say in the state funding formula. You know, their responsibility is to work with whatever funding, whatever services are, are available to them. And I think in the case of Yonkers, you know, the Yonkers success story exceeds all the other urban school districts in the state. Yonkers happens to have an 86, 87 percent graduation rate. This is a school district with 75, 80 percent of our students are students of color. So for Yonkers to compare it to similar urban education, I think, you know, we've done an outstanding job. You know, has it, has it been to our full satisfaction? No. But then I turn around and say, well, that's because we don't have the adequate funding that we should have. Come, everything comes down to the, to the fund. funding. Funding is crucial and we're shortchanged. We definitely are shortchanged. I think with what we have, I believe uh, our administration and our trustees have done a fairly good job. Thank you. Now let's move into something else. I have three important topics that yeah. we want to talk, and people are asking, is this all about school? No. We are also going to talk now about the storm and oh, the response course. that we got. And also, I want to touch bases on mental illness. Okay. I think it's important. And then we go to the other sure. stuff. So, response. response. I heard I, re I heard that Con Edison, it's an animal that it's about to become extinct. We're not seeing trucks. They are working, but very rarely we see it because I've been driving around the because I haven't seen many. I'm not saying they're not there. They are, but we are not seeing a quick response. Altis, I don't even want to mention. I have not had cable for over seven days now. I called them up. I asked, they asked me where was uh, my location. I gave them the address. And the response, oh, we've been working at your location since 7 a.m. This was three days ago. I haven't seen them one minute. I agree with you. You know, from the state perspective, uh, you know, we consider this a very serious issue. And, uh, you know, for the last couple of days since after the storm, and, uh, and many of us have witnessed the lack of what we consider adequate response from people like Con Edison and like Altice, 
Uh, and we've witnessed so many of our fellow residents with that power, with that internet, and the messages from Con Edison, if you're able to get through all T's, yeah, we're dealing with it, we're dealing with it. And the truth of the matter, they weren't dealing with it. And uh, it's, it's sad to say that, you know, that's part of the problem, that these companies, to a large extent, in my opinion, are monopolies. And whenever you have a monopoly, it really doesn't give you as a constituent, the, as a customer, the opportunity to really seek alternative services. So to a large extent, we're stuck with them for now. But we have the Public Service Commission. And as, as a state assemblyman, many of us have filed a complaint. We have in place a major hearing that the state Senate and the state assembly has uh, with people representing Con Ed and Ortiz and others to basically demand that they have in place alternative plans, that they have in place a, a, a plan B and plan C to address uh, whether it's storm related or other outrageous, you know, uh, uh, cuts in services by making sure that they have adequate staff in place to make sure that the service trucks right now they they take it on a case by case basis which really doesn't work for us you know and their plan now is when whenever you lose service you know we'll give you if you're directly impacted two hundred thirty five dollars for spoilage and food and if you're a commercial business more and if you have receipts we can pay you up to five hundred bucks we're demanding and we're looking at legislation where anyone involved in an area where there's an outage, there's an automatic payment by Con Ed Correct. and by Altis where it's credited to your account automatically. Yeah, because because yeah. I don't remember when did I save exactly. my receipts today because yeah. I might have a storm exactly. next month and what or about, next week. How about senior citizens? How about others? You, you think they save their receipts so they can recall? So Con Ed relies and Altis relies on you know, 50% or more of these individuals either not being able to follow through and, and apply for their, their losses and so forth. But with this le proposed legislation we're looking at, it demands that anytime there's an outage, that Con Edison is responsible to credit directly a certain amount. This way they think twice about not having a backup plan. Because let's not forget that the Altis did a major cut after the you know optimal they acquired optimal line yeah. mass layoffs and technical people reporters everywhere so what they have now they are not able to sustain the needs True. of the customers that they have you're right uh, they have a skeleton crew you know they figured cost effective so you really gotta you know sometimes with uh, le legal legislation uh, whether it's for injury and sometimes you want to send a message to a certain industry or business that w the conduct was wrong so therefore we're going to punish you severely it's like burning someone you know hard enough so that they realize I better be careful I better plan better yeah. I better have adequate staff in place so this statement is from me not from the assemblyman we have options and we have alternatives if you are not happy with the service you're getting from the company you decide to subscribe, look for another one. Exactly. Because until they feel it financially, they don't care much because they are all about the profit. Profit. Okay. I'm not this is my statement, not yours. And I agree with you. Oh, okay. I agree with you. I didn't want to say that the simple no, no, I agree with you. But that's how I feel. I'm strongly and powerfully and greatly considering moving to another company. Uh, you know, and I may do that too. Yeah, because it's just unacceptable. Yeah, it really is terrible. Mental illness, Mr. Nader. <laughs> okay, within the last month, we have covered multiple incidents involving suicide. One happened here in Yonkers. The other one, in the, the body of the deceased was recovered in Yonkers. For what I hear, he jumped from the George Washington Bridge. People say at times, why do I broadcast those things? It's because I feel that sometimes people need to see those images. 
in order to push people like you and elected officials to look seriously into the me mental illness issues. We need solutions. Yeah. We don't need talk about it. Oh, I feel sorry, the family. What we need is methods and procedures to deal with people who are suffering from mental illness before they actually do something like right. that. Well, me what? mental illness is serious. It's, uh, it's a serious society issue that has confronted many. Mental illness, resolving from genetics, from alcohol, from drug use, from trauma, from, uh, from illness and so forth, has really impacted so many individuals. You know, for many years we advocated reinforcing the support service program, you know, at the very basic on the educational front. You know, too many school districts, you know, including Yonkers, you know, when funding and money becomes an issue, the first services that go because they're, they're not as mandated as support services, school psychologists, social workers, you know, music is cut, art is cut, libraries, sport programs are cut, and Yonkers has been impacted by that. You know, for example, when you have a situation where for, for a psychologist or social worker has a caseload of a thousand to fifteen hundred children, how how specific can you really get into a child's you know emotional trauma and other needs? So we've we've had some improvements in that area, but from my perspective, you know we got a way to go. Uh, I made sure that part of my funding, assemblymen and senators get certain funding they can distribute to special programs. I've made sure part of my funding went to programs that focus on suicide prevention. You know, so that's that's a step in the positive direction. I have a bill in Albany presently that I'm pushing for that allows for suicide barriers at all the bridges. So all the bridges where we know many individuals that want to commit suicide go to bridges and so forth, why not be proactive? Why not have, and it's, it's not a big cost factor to put a suicide barrier preventive device on the areas of the bridge where individuals may consider suicide. But it's, it's, it's not dealing with how do we address and limit someone from committing suicide. It's what you spoke about often, the preventive. The, the preventive means putting more funding in programs and services when individuals that are having traumatic activities or events or individuals coming back from the military, there seems to be a big high rate. We have the data, we know the research, we know the population that's impacted by that. You know, it's our responsibility to treat mental illness as a very serious issue and to really provide the proper services and funding they need to make sure they can at least get guidance and get support and get medication if necessary, get the counseling they need, and if uh, employment is an issue that caused the trauma, if it's uh, illness that caused it, if it's other factors, to really provide the services so that an individual doesn't feel that they have to commit suicide and lose their lives. Six years ago, at the Santiago, walked from Yonkers, New York, to Albany in an attempt to create awareness for suicide prevention, yeah. showing that we need it. I don't think he was able to speak with the governor at that time, but he did create awareness. Actually, uh, we have to do an interview with that actor, uh, give us a call to find out what has happened after that walk. Has anything improved? Anything changed? I remember a few years ago, I don't know for how, how many years ago, but the young man jumped to his death from the, the terrace of a building on uh, Yonkers Avenue in yes. Ashburton. Yes. I heard that the mother seeked help for that child. They, she knew he wasn't well. She knew he needed attention and help, medical help was not able to get well, it. No, we did not get it. So, do our elected officials, meaning you and others, assume sure. any responsibility for things like this, 
for the lack of uh, support team when mothers sure. of those kids or brothers or sisters or whoever can seek help. Do you? It's you know it's a good point and uh, in my <clears throat> approach in two years by the way in the assembly and you know voted on many pieces yeah, of legislation. I don't mean you personally. I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. talking about the body. But you know from my personal experience. I, I've signed off and you know, the Assembly and the Senate approved so many bills that to deal with mental illness and funding for mental illness. So, you know, from my end, looking at from the grassroots efforts, you know, the activities of individuals like Hector Santiago and others that preach and advocate, you know, that to some extent the voices are heard. And that's why when people sometimes feel it's not worth it, at the end of the day, it is worth it. Do we always get the reaction that we hoped? We, it's, it's very difficult to say, yes, we got the full reaction. But when you do speak up, uh, do you get people to stop and listen and hear? I got to say yes. And I, I know as a legislator, the many people that come up to Albany, for example, or come up to the district office here in Yonkers, and they have an issue, they have a concern, we immediately look into it, we research it, we ask people to tell us what the issues and concerns are. And very often, I use that information, for speaking personally, to put together legislative packages. A lot of my bills, I have some 30 bills up in Albany, and many of them deal with day-to-day -day issues that people are concerned about. And honestly, many of them come through discussions like we're having, and, and what, what we hear from the audience, for example, issues and concerns that a light goes up and you say, you know, that really makes a lot of sense. And even as a principal, some of the best solutions we had to improve in schools and education, from my experience, came talking to kids and parents where they'll tell me, Dr. Sage, you know, I think we should do this a different way. And, and, and if it makes sense, you know, we change a policy. And I'll say to them, you know, that's because you spoke up. That's because students like yourself or parents spoke up. We made the change, you know, that yeah. improves. But you know, Mr. Nader, I have an hashtag that says actions, not words. Actions, not words. Exactly. See, I hear you. And I speak with another elected official. He might tell me exactly what he thinks I want to hear. Yeah. He will say things that the mother of the kid that jumped from the top of the roof yeah. wants to hear. We need more than just lines. Yeah. We need actions. You know, suicide and mental illness is not something that just started happening last month. No, it's been it, going on. It's been going on. And the, the lack of uh, agencies that helps the families with those, it's not being needed since last month. It's been needed for many years. We need them. We yeah. need those group of people that can deal and can help. Yeah. But all we hear is talk, talk, talk. Oh, we're going to do this, we work in this, we have a legislation, we this, we that. But there has been an increase. I mean, do we, do we continue the fight? Of course. You know, uh, has there been an increase? You know, if you look at the data and you look at the amount of services being provided today versus 10 years ago or 20 years ago, there's obviously a lot more services for mental illness and counseling and support. Uh, is it enough? I, I, I would share the same concern the community has and say it's not enough. You know, we need more. So, you know, my goal is, and, and many of my colleagues that I speak to, is to continue to address mental illness as a serious and put it in the same category as the importance of education and economic development and and other important areas, healthcare, you know, it's a major component. That that field alone impacts so many categories and impacts so many families that are sometimes are the destruction that's caused to families. Not only the individual when a person has mental illness is tremendous. So you know, the fight needs to continue, and and advocates need to continue to have their voices heard. You know, so I would say. Yes, there is a lot of solutions. There's a lot more funding. I mentioned earlier, when I was looking to designate whatever funding we were allocated, I chose to give part of that funding for suicide prevention. 
So I, I, I as an individual recognize it from my days as an educator, someone who's active in the community. And when I went to Albany, as I said, I've seen so many pieces of legislation before us that I and the majority of us voted for uh, that that directly increase funding for mental illness services. Yeah. So I think there's an improvement, but we still got to continue. Yes. Because I think that nothing can be more horrible than open the door of your 14-year-old uh, in the morning and see him uh, there or your child jumping from the 10th yeah. floor. It's terrible. It's, it's, it's uh, terrible. I, I think it's unbearable. I think none of us can even understand the pain that that mother father are feeling especially when they seek for help yeah. but they couldn't get the help that they needed that's yeah, frustrating let's move into something else sure Kamala Harris <clears throat> she was picked as the vice president running mate for Joe Biden how you feel about that well you know many of us expected uh, I mean the, the uh, vice president Biden uh, did make it clear that he was looking to pick a woman and, and preferably he made a very clear woman of color and uh, it was part of you know the movement we're, we're facing in America, a movement that promotes diversity, a movement that acknowledges you know uh, civic, civic responsibility and involvement and really uh, develops you know in this case for the Democratic Party a coalition that brings in the party base and it's no secret you know when it comes to Democrat platforms that uh, the woman vote is very important the African-American vote is very important and to his credit uh, hopefully soon to be President Biden uh, recognizes that uh, he needs to bring in you know qualified individuals <clears throat> especially as a running mate, uh, not only is it important to diversify a political ticket, but you got to look at many other factors. I mean, historically, for many years, I've watched how both parties, when they pick their top two to represent them in the presidential race for president and vice president, they made sure very often that there was geographic balance and so if you look at where Biden is from, you know, the Northeast, and you look at Kamala Harris from California, that really brings geographic balance. You have East and West ticket. Kamala Harris brings with her a base in California where, you know, for fundraising purposes, there's many industries in California. So the accessibility to fundraising is tremendous when you bring in a Kamala Harris. And uh, her skills in law enforcement are crucial today more than ever because we're witnessing and experiencing, especially with police and reform and, and issues impact and safety and diversity and, and uh, you know, the systematic racism that has been confronting our society and community. A Kamala Harris ticket, I think, addresses a lot of those issues. So there was many wonderful opportunities I'm sure the Vice President was looking at, but at the end of the day, I think uh, most of us watching this process feel that uh, this was a proper decision. Now, social justice, it's a, high, a very hot ticket nowadays. It is. And uh, Pamela, Kamala Harris being accused of not being too fair in the social justice in regards to black incarcerations and all that. So how is she gonna reconcile her record with the social justice that the American people are now demanding? But, <clears throat> see, I look at that and I say, it's really unfair, you know, in light of the big push for social justice and reform, you know, reform, sometimes uh, there's a process to bring about reform. And sometimes it's, it's, it's really, in my opinion, unfair you know, to look back at a Kamala Harris background in law enforcement or other minorities, African Americans and Latinos that were police commissioners and district attorneys, you know, during the last number of years and say, well, you know, you didn't change the system 10 years ago or your track record five years ago, you know, didn't show what we expect today. 
you know, that's unfair because these individuals were promoted within their departments, they, they achieved a tremendous amount of success, and sometimes it takes a gradual movement, you know, to promote change. So, in my opinion, uh, you know, I, I disagree with the fact that people accuse her of being insensitive. I'm sure, you know, the dynamics of the time were such where she had to navigate through a department that was going through change and and sometimes you know it's expected some of us want change immediately and some of us say you know what uh, you got to promote change step by step and uh, so I don't look at that as a weakness I really continue to look at her experience in law enforcement and I think it brings a necessary necessary component to the Democrat platform or the Democrat ticket with Biden Right, so you think that we will have a new president November 3rd, 2020? Well, well, what is your feeling? My, my, feel my feeling, honestly, is, you know, I always say, politically, don't take anything for granted. You know, people... 2016 people, teaches yeah, that. Exactly. Anybody that's overconfident should be, should think twice. You know, I really believe, and we said it at the last show, that, in my opinion, the factors that will determine who wins this presidency had, had not happened yet. I, th I think we're talking about, you know, in this election, because of the dynamics and the circumstances, you know, between September and October, you know, usually decisions are made, issues are addressed, you know, the, the dynamics that determine who's in the lead usually happen months and months before the presidential election. In this case, I really believe it's it's the last 50 days before the election that will determine what will determine the status of the economy, whether schools can reopen safely, uh, whether the employment numbers improve, whether foreign affairs uh, doesn't take a, a, a worse or a better circumstance. And more important, the number one issue in my opinion is the vaccination. And, and the lack of uncertainty by many in the country is, uh, with regards to the pandemic and COVID-19 really, you know, would be put to rest if at least a safe vaccine was in the process and the, gov the government in this case and the president takes credit for it, then, then that could be a dynamic. How we move forward with social justice initiative, in my opinion, is crucial. As much as we lobby and work hard for social reform and justice, again, as I said earlier, it has to be done in a process. Many Americans are looking at, for example, the social justice movement that's going on in today's time. And unfortunately, what's tied to, and to that movement happens to be, to some extent, you know, unacceptable behavior with rioting and the lobbying and the vandalism that has uh, impacted cities like Chicago and Portland and even New York City. You know, to many Americans, that's an issue. So when I talk about addressing issues and doing it in a way that's gradual and in a way that it doesn't cause winners and losers, you know, to me, that's very important. So what the opinion of middle America, what the opinion of silent America is really what will determine this presidential race. So that's why the message to each and every one of us that's advocating for change, let's make sure we promote change and let's get rid of the, whatever the violent end to that change and whether it's intentional or non-intentional. And many people feel people are using the opportunity and the motive to commit vandalism. So what happened in Chicago that's going to be in the eyes. So, you know, my recommendation to the, our protest movement, you know, make sure you do so and make sure the message is loud and clear. Keep it safe, keep it orderly, and make sure that you focus on what our needs are, and that is to reform police and, and other social agents of change. And, and, uh, and to speak up against any form of violence. And guys, don't forget that that change will not come about unless you come out and vote. Regardless of who you're voting for, vote. You vote.
come out and vote. Well, the, the, in the primaries, we witnessed uh, such a high turnout. Yes, we did. You know, with with the with the paper ballots and the early voting. So really, unlike the past, there really is no reason for someone to say, "Well, you know, I was busy election day, or I, I you know, my work schedule, or that my excuse doesn't count that anymore." That doesn't count anymore. So now, more than ever. You can vote by paper, you can vote by mail, you can go into various locations, you know, uh, 10 days before the election and vote, or you can wait till election day and make sure you get out. And even election day from generally 6 a.m. to 9 p.m., you know, it's a lot of you hours know, in the Mr. day. Mr. Nader, but uh, someone is making an argument that the mail-in votes brings in corruption, they're not true, you know, yeah. you think so? Well, you know, Unfortunately, in politics, in anything, you got to look at what the best, the one best system is. So even though whether education or anything that is important for us, you know, we put in place a system that to a large extent gives us the greatest success. And when you open the voting process with early voting and paper ballots and so forth, in my opinion, it enhances democracy because at the end of the day, you know, we want the highest number of our citizens to vote. We feel that when the highest number vote, that's the best reflection of how people's opinion is with regards to who they choose to legislate and, and to represent us. Now, is there potential room for corruption in anything we do? There's always, there's always a potential for people that may use the process to vote twice. <clears throat> Does it happen? It happened in the past. I can recall elections where people were voting for individuals that were deceased, the people that were, were in cemeteries and people were voting. So even long before, you know, we opened up the process to include more voters, there, there was always some issues. So, you know, my message is open up the process, get as many people to vote, and always recognize, as in anything we do in life, you got to have a system in place to try to assure that there wasn't corruption, there wasn't people that were voting more than one time. That's unjust. You know, so, so you know, it's like the gains or the benefits outweigh the potential risk. Gotcha. This is one of those. Let's talk about the executive actions that uh, the current president is signing. What yeah. is your view? What do you think about that? <clears throat> well, I think the president you know, let's recognize that, you know, the $600 stimulus, you know, ended right at the end of July. And in a way, many individuals decided, well, you know, it was good while it lasted. Now maybe we should go back to work. So from that end, I really believe, you know, the system was, was a benefit for many and the funding was necessary. But for many, many individuals, they could have gone to work and they were earning more on unemployment with the stimulus than going to work. You know, so from that end, you know, the president recognized that uh, maybe he needed to take positive initiatives. Even though the federal government, the Congress, and the president were still negotiating for this new stimulus package, the president used his executive orders powers and said, well, I'm going to address the needs that many Americans have that are losing the stimulus checks, and I'm going to restore it with a $400, you know, stimulus check. So that, along with uh, an order that that told students that were paying student loans, I'm going to forgive you with the interest continuously for another year, and then you know he took an active role with given some protections against evictions, you know, so the president, you know, went into the heart of what is traditionally Democrat issues, and he took the initiative long before, let's say, there was a negotiated settlement between him and the Congress. Now, Pelosi, who's the speaker, majority speaker, and even Senator Schumer from New York, who played the major role in, in negotiating, were upset because the president took them off guard, you know, and he said, you know what, I'm not going to wait till you guys come to the table and finalize a negotiation. These are specific needs. I'm going to use my executive order powers as president to initiate them. And P 
politically, he might have gained a lot of support from that, from people. And, and, and maybe that's what he was going after. The exactly. political support, exactly. not because he genuinely wanted exactly. to help and give those things. He caught the, but that's the, practical. That's practical. He, he was smart on that one. Yeah. But New York is saying, look, we don't have the money. Yeah, because they're now they're requiring that the president wants municipalities and state to pay 25% of their benefit, right? So the 25% New York saying, we're still waiting for the federal government to give us the funds that we desperately need now. New York State, for example, you know, the, the new estimates of what the coronavirus cost New York was anywhere between 10 to $15 billion. So now communities that are relying on school funding and healthcare funding are looking to the state and the state is saying, you know, we're way behind the eighth ball at this stage unless the federal government comes through with the funding. So which brings us, and again, we're talking about presidential year, you know, we're, we're, we're two months before an election, you know, what do you politically expect the president to do if he wants to be reelected? What we spoke about, the four executive orders he signed, definitely was, you know, in his, in his opinion, a move in the positive direction. What would the president do? If I was advising him politically, I would say make sure you tie in state funding, federal funding for states in need, you know, maybe three weeks before or two weeks before the election. So he becomes the hero that safeguards right. New York and allows New York City and, and Yonkers schools to reopen. And the president puts out his message that if it wasn't for the president, the states would go under default. It was a good move, right? It was, <laughs> it was almost like checkmate, you know? Yeah, yeah. Now what you gonna do? Yeah. You see people, I'm willing to help, but the Democrats are, uh, you know, are blocking. I'm, they're, they're not coming to the negotiation exactly. table. They forced me to use executive powers to preserve to help you. your unemployment benefits, your, you know, your housing needs to avoid eviction. For many of you that are students with with loans and high interest rates, I'm, I'm going to put that interest rate increase or demand on hold. You know, so what does that voting population do? So there's still a lot of uncertainty. Would most of these voters look at the president's actions and say, well, that was politically motivated and, and we're still going to vote our conscience and vote for what we feel we need as a nation? Or are many of them going to say, hey, you know what, Wh whoever does for me last, you know, what, have you, you. what have you done for me lately, lately. right? So, we heard that song. Yeah. Now, let's talk about you, things that you've been working on, things that you, you know, legislation that you've been. Sure. Tell us a little bit about that to conclude this hour interview. Well, one, one very important bill uh, that, uh, that I have, uh, and I'm pushing for it to get it passed, I went to visit Elizabeth Seaton Pediatric Center here in Yonkers on Executive Boulevard. And I was really you know, impressed during the time of COVID-19 that they celebrated the fact that nobody on their staff had, had the virus. And all their children, many of them you know, were children in a pediatric uh, center they were getting nursing care, they were getting vital services. These are like living facilities for high need individuals that have serious disabilities where they need constant care. And the problem there that came to my attention was that once these children were over 21 years old, then they were t considered adults and, and there was a gap in providing continuous care. So many of these young people that were functioning to the best of their abilities and safeguarded at a facility like Elizabeth Seaton, you know, there was an issue where the institution now, you know, even if they were to keep them there, you know, they weren't authorized to get proper billing or funding for providing the services. And that really, you know, brought up for me an antenna because I know for example, as an educator, when, you, when we dealt for many years with children with special needs or learning disabilities or physical disabilities, my biggest concern is once they graduated high school or they finished the public schools, you know, there was a major gap 
you know, with the rest of their lives? What kind of service provides them a continuation after that? And that gap caused a, a, a serious deterioration. So with the Elizabeth Seaton, the recognition was, why can't they hold on if these young men and women are functioning really well at this facility? Why can't they maintain that beyond 20, 21 years of age? And then the legislation, you know, would address that by saying, you know what, they're allowed to keep them beyond 21 if they're doing really well there and they want to stay there. And But the legislation would order those payees, people that are paying for the service, insurance carriers and others, to make sure that the center is not shortchanged when they're paying for benefits. I reached out to Senator Andre Stewart Cousins, majority leader, who agreed to co-sponsor this bill in the Senate. And my hope is, and I've reached out to the speaker already, you know, to get it to address, there's a good chance they may call us back uh, for a week in September. So I'm trying to get this bill passed so that not only at the Elizabeth Seaton Center, but across the state, we can really address a major need impact in, you know, young people, you know, that have a serious issue with being cut off from their services after 21. And we know if you have a serious disability, imagine you're in a safe atmosphere, safe center, nourishing, a loving center, and all of a sudden, you know, your, your, your 21st birthday that you're told you gotta leave here and go to an adult center somewhere. You know, so that's not fair. So, you know, part of when we spoke earlier about mental illness and addressing those needs, this is another vulnerable population, you know, especially those with serious disability. So that's that piece of legislation resulted, as I said, by visiting the center during COVID-19, speaking to the administration, to the students and the residents that were there, and, and, and hearing what their concerns are. So this is a piece of legislation that will impact statewide situations like that. And that's why we say, speak up. If nobody spoke out to me and told me we got a serious issue, it wouldn't have happened. Good enough. Now, to conclude, Mr. Nader, you heard about uh, the shootout at uh, Spring Ridge uh, yeah. Park two or three days ago. We broadcast as part of it. I don't know if you saw it. I saw it. It's a problem. It is a problem. Okay. You know, it's a serious problem. I mean, what do you do? See, with all the cert uncertainty and, and, and the push for normalcy, you know, the urgency to get Yonkers residents and county residents uh, at least to go back to county facilities, to go to pools and enjoy it. You know, this means that now there's a push to make sure there's more security, that, you know, we gotta check individuals coming in and out of these pools to make sure does it get to the level where you need metal detectors? But you know, Miss, uh, Mr. Nader, where do you need the, me the metal detectors? Maybe by the cemetery? Because this didn't happen inside the pool, it happened in the parking in lot. The parking now, lot. what about if something happens on the hill up to the parking lot? Or maybe 100 feet away exactly, from it? Yeah. Where are we going to do the check? Well, that, that's why, you know, you know, the message to just society in general, you know, you know, we're already short tremendous funding. You know, my, my point was, you know, we're already behind the eighth ball financially. We really can't afford anything new, you know, but if you must for safety, of course, you gotta take away funding from something else, you know. So by, by providing more security, does that take away county funding from mental illness programs, from yeah. social service programs? So, you know, it's sad that individuals would come to recreational facilities with guns and weapons and so forth. You know, it, it's just a sad state of affairs. You it know? is, but what about if you, were, if you are caught with an illegal gun? There is no bail, there is, man, yeah, there is mandatory jail time because you don't walk with a gun just because you wanna walk with a gun. Exactly. You're gonna use it if and, you and, need and it. And most people that carry guns and weapons I'm sure the majority, if you check their records, have prior prior history of criminal activity. So this is a message that uh, now has resonated the need for 
reform and bail reform again. You know, if you recall, the concept of bail reform, you know, was a great program to make sure there was equity, that similar crimes, you know, even minor crimes didn't result in one person going home and the other person going to jail because they can't afford it. So that's something I agree with. And I, you know, you, you look for fairness, but so at the same I. time, yeah. But at the same time, you know, the concern I have and many have now is because of incidents like this and others is that, you know, as good as bail reform was, you know, you need to make sure that those that commit criminal activities that are in the range of felonies or more, that these individuals have to be held accountable. And you can't have a process in place where a crime is committed and people feel, I can commit the crime and be out on the streets right away and commit another crime. So I think we got to go back to the table again. Definitely, definitely. And, and really, you know, reform bail reform. Yeah, reform bail reform. <laughs> Because look, the place was full of kids. Yeah. I was there and I actually capture an image of one of the suspects. It was another kid. He was a child. Was okay. A child. Then I'm looking at the picture. 13, 14, 15. This is another kid. Yeah. So something is totally wrong. Not just with the legal system, bail reform but perhaps with the way that we raise our ch children. That's definitely, I mean, people don't like to hear it, and we say it, you know, in the educational system and, and society in general, you know, we as parents, we, we as a society need to address, you know, home life and responsibility at home and, you know, the importance of a family structure and, uh, you know, the parents need to recognize that whether it's divorce, whether it's fathers leaving a household, that children that are raised with that stability, there's a greater likelihood of concerns later on in life. So, you know, we need to take responsibility and, and, and really address, you know, family life and safety and security and advising our children, whether it's the importance of schools, the importance of career preparation, social values, respect, you know, we seem to have lost a lot of that. And, uh, you know, society has become so fragmented where we're not taking responsibility for our children. We're not taking responsibility. And we, you know, it's become a fact now that, you know, our children can, can go astray fire and uh, not really address, you know, their responsibilities in life. And we see it with education. I've always said, you know, an effective learning atmosphere requires parents and educators working together, school home collaboration. And when we when we see a situation where parents don't care about education, you know, that impacts the child. And I can tell you, when I see a situation where parents addressed education and visited with the teachers and they stayed active with the child's school and the child in my opinion, maximize their learning potential. And that goes for everything in life, you know. So, you know, it's a good point uh, that that uh, society in general has had many faults. And one of the biggest faults, you know, is really the decay of family structure in our nation. And that's something that moving forward Maybe we need to really re-educate society in general and bring back maybe what some people may consider was all-time traditional values, but maybe we need to do a little bit more of that. You heard it from an educator himself. Mr. Nader, thank you for taking the time to sitting with us. I'm sure that those guys watching us appreciate you. Well, my okay. pleasure. So you guys, tune in two weeks from now. We will have other updates. You know, occasionally, as you know, Mr. Nader might be in Albany. We might skip one or, you know, here and there. But we will make every attempt to be here every two weeks to give you an update on what's going on, plans for the future, whatever things we think it's important and, and the community needs to know. Well, thank so you thank very you. much. Thank Mr. Nader, you. this is the new, uh, the, the new <laughs> handshake. <laughs> thank you very much for you guys for watching. Until next time, stay tuned for more. Beautiful.